name is Eve Eve Chisuli Chabu, and I'm a professor in biological sciences uh, here at the University of Missouri, Columbia. And I guess to answer the question, how did we get to the story that we recently published in Onco Targets? So we. When we first started, we really started from the concept that in clinics, one of the significant challenges is to identify therapeutics that are highly selective. And so by that, I mean having an agent that can selectively kill the cancer cells without killing the normal cells. So a lot of these cancer therapeutics, especially when you talk about chemotherapies, they don't know the not only kill the cancer cell, but also call the normal cells. So this can generate considerable toxicities and, and uh, morbidities for the patient. So we started from a sort of need to come up with a different way to target these cancer cells, but also to do it in a way that does not necessarily require an a priori understanding of the molecular landscape or the molecular drivers of that cancers, right? So let me just take a step back. So we now know with the precision medicine approach, one can obtain biopsies from the patients and then from those biopsies, define the molecular landscape, or at least identify genes that are driving the cancer. And that knowledge will then inform the physician's decision as to which therapy is better suited for that patient. So that's your precision medicine space. So, and that has led to significant improvement in terms of patient outcome. But what we wanted to do was to also think about ways that are not that selective. In other words, to find the strategies that can target cancers more broadly. Now, about a century ago or more, there was this realization that bacteria can target cancer cells. And we had already some data showing that this specific uh, Salmonella strain that we had could target cancer cell, basically killing cancer cells by leaving the normal cell largely unaffected. So we then reasoned that maybe we can utilize that and go into an in vivo model to really test the efficacy of that approach or how good that approach was. So, and we turned to prostate cancer because that's where we had all these, most of these data, right? So we turned to the prostate cancer and the, there's a mouse prostate cancer model and as you probably know this, also cancers uh, can develop resistance to treatments and the therapeutic landscape for that indication is limited. So immunotherapy also doesn't work there. Uh, and hormone therapy eventually leads to uh, relapse uh, for those patients. So we took that specific indication, and meaning that specific cancer type, and asked, does this bacteria that shows tumor tropism in vitro, that shows selectivity in vitro, can it also generate similar effects in an animal model? So that was really where we started. That's really the initial question that we went after. So during the course of the study, what was really unexpected was that although we saw these uh, targeting, so we can see the biologic or bacteria homing into the cancer tissue very specifically, so they're colonizing the cancer tissues. And not only they're colonizing the cancer tissue, but they are staying there. And they are staying there for at least a couple of days. And that, that finding w w is relevant because normally these bacteria get cleared away really fast in the host. But what we saw is that it was able to go into the cancer tissue and, and stay in the cancer tissue. So that is really important, right? So you can now have the bacteria that is going to the tumor and then it is colonizing, I mean, they have to divide in these tumors and evade clearance. So that was really encouraging for us, right? So then we asked, so if the bacteria is staying in the tissue, can we, I guess you can, let me put it this another way. So if the bacteria is staying in the tissue, you also want to make sure that the bacteria itself doesn't accumulate additional genetic mutation that will make it lose its characteristics. And the characteristics that I have in mind here is really the safety, right? So we had shown that the bacteria itself was quite safe in this animal model, so we didn't see some really significant toxicities in these mice. And we had also evaluated it in dogs, uh, where it was well tolerated. So what you want then is to have a biologic, I mean a bacteria, 
Um, so I'll use the word biologic and bacteria almost interchangeably. But what you want is that not only you targeting the cancer tissue and it is stable in the cancer environment, but you want to make sure that bacteria doesn't accumulate additional genetic lesion such that it loses all its characteristics, i.e. its ability to persist in the tumor micro environment and to kill off the cancer cells. Right? So then what we decided to do was, was okay, let's then evaluate its genomic uh, stability. And, and in so doing, we could see clearly that it was also genomically stable. So then we had a series of characteristics and, and quite frankly, quite attractive characteristics. So we had a biologic that was safe, and in addition to that, it was able to target the cancer tissue. And three, it was genetically stable, even after it colonized the tissue for days and weeks. So that was very encouraging. So then we asked, what are the consequences of these targeting effects? What are the consequences? of having the biologic going into the cancer cells. And one area uh, that we really wanted to focus on is the ability of these cancer cells to now release immunogenic molecules, right? So you want the cancer cell to release molecules that can now attract the immune cells uh, to the tumor microenvironment. Why is that important? It is important, especially in the case of prostate cancer, because the prostate cancer environment is immunosuppressive. Right? So prostate cancer does uh, enact mechanism to suppress immune cells and exclude, really, immune cells from the, the cancer tissue. And because of that, even your immunotherapeutics that have shown great results in, say, skin cancers, they don't work on a prostate, right? So for prostate cancer, they need, there is a need for strategies that can remove that immune barrier so that these immunotherapeutics can actually work in that setting. So we then reasoned, we now have a bacteria that we know is immunogenic, right? It's a bacteria after all. And, and it goes to the tumor, colonizes the tumor, and then it is genetically stable in that tumor. Now we will we say, let's see if it test the hypothesis that this bacteria can also have a immunogenic effect. So that is, it can cause its cancer cell to release all these chemokine into the tumor micro environment and in so doing recruit immune components in the cancer cells. And, and he did. So that was really satisfying. So we could see from those experiments that animals that were treated with the bacteria, their cancers, and this again, uh, the prostate cancer mouse model, their cancers had a lot more infiltration of immune cells. Right? So you had timing immune components in the tumor micro environment and they were there in a higher frequency or quantity, if you will, than the control mice that were just treated with, with the buffer. So we thought, well, this is really, this is great, right? So we are getting an immune stimulation. We are recruiting immune components now into in the tumor tissue. If that's the case, we should expect to see an increase of cancer-killing immune cells as well. So we saw a series, a different type of immune cells in the cancer microenvironment, right? So CD8, uh, CD4 positive cells, which are required and critical to activate the cytotoxic CD8 positive cells. So we saw an increase of CD4 positive cells in a cancer microenvironment. And then we asked if we could also see these CD8 positive or cytotoxic T cells. And unfortunately, whatever we saw there was really transient. Right? So we'll see some CD8 positive cells, but then they'll rapidly, those numbers will basically, will, that will dwindle down and you get a decrease. So that hinted to us, it really hinted that perhaps what is happening, the cancer cells are deactivating these CD8 positive cells. So they are deactivating the cytotoxic T cells. And one mechanism is essentially through these PD, PDL and PD1 mechanism. So we then thought if we could couple the use of the bacteria with blockades of the signaling axis, so that is we're now preventing cancer cells from inhibiting CD8 T cells, we will see a decrease in disease burden. So that was the hypothesis that we went in. It was very rewarding to see that indeed when we couple now these immunogenic and tumor-targeted bacteria with antibodies that block 
the PD-1, uh, PDL uh, signaling axis, we could now decrease disease burden in these animals. So for us, that was really, and I think that's the novelty of the paper, right? So that is to use something that one wouldn't even consider using, right? So you're using a bacteria, genetically attenuated bacteria, uh, nonetheless, but it's still a bacteria. And, and utilizing its immunogenic capabilities to and engage immune components and activate these cancer-fighting immune cells definitely has some merit. And in this case, we could actually see a decrease in disease burden in these mice. So that was really, really, for us, it was really proof of principle that one can use this immunogenic biologic to now break down the immune barrier we talked about at the beginning and allow the immune components or the immune cells, or the host immune cells, to suppress or to kill off uh, the cancers. So it's a proof of principle, and, and my hope is that the rest of the fields and all the other researchers out there, uh, the community will manage to summon, sort of, uh, to get past the, this, this concept that it is a bacteria and really see what else you can, how you can better functionalize it to achieve better clinical outcomes, right? Because that's why we're all into this. We're all into this to help our patients. So if we can come up with strategies that can leverage these characteristics of this biologic to indeed generate some durable clinical benefit for patient, then it's a win-win situation. Now, so what is next, really? So what would be the next chapter? So I would think that in addition to, and, and I really hope this happens, that the entire community picks this up and try to see better ways of functionalizing it to achieve a better outcome. Another benefit of this biologic, right, so you can use it as a immune uh, or tumor immune activating agent, but you can also use it as a vehicle, right? So you can envision uh, leveraging is tumor targeting capacity um, to deliver therapeutic loads into cancers, right? And uh, so you can pack therapeutics into the cells and you can do this. It doesn't have to be small molecules, but you, these are things that can be genetically engineered in uh, the bacteria and be delivered specifically, at least with preference, preferentially delivered into the tumor tissues. So that is also a, I would think, a clear application for this biologic. I think I should also note that there is a potential here to expand this to other cancer types where immunotherapy does not work, right? And here we have started looking at pancreatic cancer. Because pancreatic cancer has the same limitation, meaning that it's an highly immunologically suppressed environment. So these are considered immunologically, immunologically cold environment cancers. So we are now using that in that indication in pancreatic cancers. And we are seeing really beautiful responses in the host. Uh, we're doing this in mice. But we can see from the spleen, uh, you can see a nice activation of immune components in animals that are treated, in animals that have both, that have the cancer and treated with uh, these bacteria. So you can see an elevation of these uh, CD8 uh, cells in the spleen. Uh, we do see, just like in the prostate cancer study, we see that it does not always translate, right? So when you, well, the, the splenic activation that we're seeing does not necessarily translate into a durable colonization of the tumor by these CD8 positive cells, right? So it's similar to what we saw in the prostate. It's a transient colonization, and then I think you have these suppressive mechanisms that are enacted by the cancer to keep the immune cells away. But now you can imagine even for that specific indication, coupling checkpoint blockades or immunotherapy with the biologic, we can now uh, also then uh, suppress, at least that's the hypothesis that we are uh, pursuing. We can now suppress these really deadly, and again, these, the therapeutic landscape for that indication is really meager and needing additional agents. So we would like to see that maybe this biologic, this bacteria coupled with, with immunotherapy will generate some benefits in animal models. And here we're talking about just shrinking of the cancers and, and ideally extending animal life. So those are the, the sort of the spaces where I can see opportunities. And again, the pancreatic cancer space, we, we, we're definitely exploring opportunity uh, for this biologic in that context. So, but, but I really hope that the entire community can, uh, can uh, leverage some of the characteristics of this uh, bacteria to help out uh, to our patients. Now, 
I should also say that it's not that wild a concept, right? So people have used oncolytic viruses, and in fact, there are trials, people using oncolytic viruses to essentially generate immune response and therefore kill, uh, eliminate the, the, the cancers. So here is a similar approach, just like people are using colitic viruses uh, in clinical trials and clinical studies. Here we're using a bacteria and, and it's generating some killing locally, but also activating the release of these immunogenic factors, which then recruits immune cells. Uh, to the cancer. So I think it's definitely a, a good proof of principle. It's a good place to start. It's a good place to be. And then I think a further development is needed to really even further refine this technology and, and see if we can evaluate more broadly across different types of, of cancers, right? So we are using it, you know, immunotherapy setting, but we also have some additional data in the context of, of chemotherapy. We're seeing some really interesting interaction between chemotherapies and hormone therapies also uh, in the prostate cancer space. So chemotherapy, hormone therapy, immunotherapy in the prostate cancer space, there is some clear interaction between this agent and those therapeutics. So I, I think it's very important to mention, uh, I, I don't think there, I could say it in, in more stronger terms, but I'm a big proponent of collaborative research and, and this work would not have been possible without the collaboration. And in fact, if you look on, on the manual script. It's um, people across institutions. Right? So we have researchers like at Yale that perform some of these immunological profiling, or this profiling the immune landscapes in, in all these mice. And we also have my colleagues here at MU that played a, an important role in modeling, right? So you see we actually integrated uh, all these different aspects of, of research. So we had immunologists contributing we had people that were modeling all these genomic data that we had. So all that came together to make this story possible. So again, I really think that this paper, I mean, this manuscript really exemplifies the utility and the value of collaborative research across different disciplines, right? So again, so it was genomics, it was some mathematical modeling, and we had basic cell biology. And then you also had people in animal science helping with this, and this uh, people in radiology and radio imaging helping with this. So it was really team effort uh, where everybody brought to the table some unique aspects of the strength, and that's how this, this paper really came into being. So uh, I want to thank every single one of my collaborators and people in a lab. I want to thank Bakul, a co-author on the paper, for their hard work. I want to thank Rob, who's also first author on that paper. And again, they worked tirelessly. So there was a postdoc, and they worked tirelessly to really make sure that uh, everything was done to the highest standards. So that was really great. Uh, that was fantastic. And of course, I want to thank all my colleagues on the manuscript, Elke Gulden, Becca Yale, and, and our imaging facility here. So it was really a team effort. And Dr. Strober also for his modeling on the manuscript. But that was really fantastic. And we had a lot of fun with it. So, so he really, the modeling really started as a casual conversation. And it really evolved. And it was something that we did. We started over the phone. And then, uh, so Dr. Strober and myself, our families play soccer together. So we will play soccer. And at the end of the soccer, we start talking about these, this concept, how we can model this. And then we follow it up with phone conversations. And again, with more soccer. And uh, the rest is history. So it was, it was really nice. It was really pleasant. Mm -hmm.